It is now time for question period. The Leader of Her Majesty's Loyal Opposition. Thank you, Speaker. And I'll just say, uh, Speaker, to my, uh, my colleagues on all sides, thank you for the standing ovation for the birth of uh, little, uh, little Maitland. Um, I presume that, though, was for Debbie, because I actually had a lot easier part of the, part of the job. Here, here. <laughs> but thank you to my, um, all my colleagues for the very kind um, best wishes and congratulations. Um, my question, Speaker, is to the Premier. Premier, um, I, I noticed that uh, when you changed your cabinet after Minister Jeffrey left cabinet, you decided to um, increase the size of your cabinet. Um, yet again. Uh, I think leadership starts at the top. This is the second time you've chosen to expand your cabinet. Um, don't you think that was a mistake? Yes. Thank you, uh, no, Mr. Speaker, I don't think it was a mistake. And uh, uh, we actually, um, you know, we need, we need the people at the table to uh, make the decisions and uh, do the work that is required, Mr. Speaker. And uh, so uh, I made decisions, have put uh, two people into uh, cabinet who are very competent, experienced, and uh, are bringing very important voices to the table. And, and Mr. Speaker, in terms of uh, in terms of the, the in terms of the size of cabinet, Mr. Speaker, I understand that the uh, Uh, no different than yesterday. Carry on, please. I understand that the leader of the opposition has 34 shadow cabinet positions. Whoa. So, Mr. Speaker, that would be uh, that would foreshadow what he would do if he were premier, Mr. Speaker. We're not going there. Two supplementary. <laughs> Well, no, uh, you, you're, you're, you're not getting raises, you're not getting limousines, you're not getting extra staff in my shadow cabinet. No, here's the here's difference, Premier, and I think you know this. Um, what you've done by adding on additional cabinet ministers now for the second time uh, is it shows that you're more interested in appeasing Liberal MPPs than taxpayers in the province. But that's, that's the problem. Uh, I have hardworking MPPs, I'm proud of them, but they don't get raises when they're in the shadow cabinet. Yours do. They get drivers and staff. So here's a contrast I want to raise for you. I, I visited actually a real cabinet maker the other day, Sergeant and here. He runs Hallmark Furniture. He's actually a real cabinet minister maker, but he's gone from 40 employees down to four under the Liberal government because of the cost of doing business. I, I actually want to send a signal to him that we've got our fiscal house in order. We're going to grow the economy. I want to see his cabinet business increase, and I want to put yours out of business, quite frankly. And Greenland's going to balance the budget problems right here. Please. Please. Thank you. For your you know, I, I understand that this is a this is a, a gimmick that the uh, that the leader of the opposition wants to focus on. Um, he was a member of a cabinet under uh, a, a previous government that had 26 members in it, Mr. Speaker. So the fact is, we have work to do in this government, Mr. Speaker. I, uh, I'll have to do what I didn't want to do. The member from Renfrew, Nipissing, Pembroke, come to order. The member from Nipissing, come to order. And the member from Chatham, Kent, Essex, come to order. Carry on, please. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And I, I heard someone say that I'm dismissive. I'm not dismissive of the concerns of the economy of this province, Mr. Speaker. I'm not dismissive of the need to put in place the strategies that are going to create jobs. I am dismissive. The member from Prince Edward uh, Hastings, come to order. Opposition, Mr. Speaker, who is putting Griffin forward Walton, come to a order. notion that would actually stop job creation Answer. in the province, Mr. Yeah. Speaker, that would cut the economic growth, that would force. Good jobs out Thank of the you. province. That's what he's putting forward. We're not. Even Thank you. Final supplementary. Uh, you know, um, Sally Premier, you have been dismissive of concerns of Sergi to here and, and other job creators across the province. I mean, you once called manufacturing job losses a myth. Um, I saw it in person, sadly. It went from 40 and House Leader, down. come to order. I want to see them get back up to 40. That's why I'm focused on my million jobs plan of creating the environment for entrepreneurs like this to succeed to hire again. To go to 40, four to 40. The uh, Minister more. of Rural Affairs will come to order. You actually have now more cabinet ministers than you do backbenchers and non-cabinets. I think that sends the wrong signal to job creators about your seriousness in balancing the books of the province. So let me ask you this very directly. You are focusing on quantity rather than quality of your cabinet. I think you should reduce it down to 16. I think that's the appropriate size to send the right signal and a big difference between you and me. So, Premier, will you accept my 
challenge to actually, instead of growing the cabinet, reduce it down to 16, get them focused on jobs and the economy, and send the signal to taxpayers that you're serious about balancing the books Thank in you. our great province of Ontario. Thank you. You see the face? You see the face? Thank you, Premier. Mr. Speaker, you know um, the the leader of the uh, opposition is is focusing on uh, cost here. You know, there's a lot of work to be done, and we uh, I have uh, I have the cabinet that uh, we need in order to uh, make the decisions and put the policies in place that will move us forward. But, Mr. Speaker, the uh, the leader of the opposition, in fact, his party is blocking a piece of legislation yeah. oh. that would actually freeze, would continue the freeze on MPP yeah. salaries, Mr. Right. Speaker. So if he's so concerned. If he's so concerned about the wages and the cost of MPPs in this parliament, that's enough. The uh, order. Carry on. We don't think it's appropriate, Mr. Speaker, for MPPs to have a, an increase. We Member need this Stormont, legislation Dundas to continue that increase. I think that it would be very helpful Sir. if the uh, Leader of the Opposition would work with us to freeze the salaries, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. New question. The Leader of the Third Party. Yeah, back uh, to the, uh, sorry, the Leader of the Opposition. Thanks, Speaker. Back to the, uh, back to the Premier. Um, well, well, look, Premier, I think you know this. As soon as you table legislation on MPP wage freeze, wages are frozen. I think you know those facts. That's done. And I've been calling uh, for that for years. But here's the, um, here's the opportunity, uh, uh, Premier. Let's actually do something that's going to save the taxpayers $2 billion a year and send a signal to uh, job creators across the province that we're going to balance the books and create an environment for success to set up Ontario to grow the economy and create jobs again, to restore hope to people like Sergi to here and the 36 employees that used to work for him. So why don't you actually amend this legislation and add in an across-the-board wage here, here. freeze for the broader public sector that will save us $2 billion a year. Will you do the right thing? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Premier. Very much, Mr. Speaker. Well, I think I think the leader of the opposition knows perfectly well that we are working across the government. Here from the Carlton, come to order. There, there have been billions of dollars saved, Mr. Speaker, because Duff, of Duff the uh, bargaining processes order. that we've engaged in, and we are going to continue to work in partnership with our with the employees within government and the broader public service, Mr. Speaker. The leader of the opposition wants a fight. He wants a fight with the people who do the business of this province, the people who deliver services in this province. He wants to fire education workers. He wants to fire health care workers, Mr. Speaker. He's not interested in making the investments in post-secondary education and in health care that are necessary, Mr. Speaker. He wants I'll tell you what I'm going to fight for. I'm going to fight for jobs. I'm going to fight for hope. I'm going to fight for a better Ontario. I'm going to plan to do that. It's called the Million Jobs Plan. To get energy under control, to lower taxes, to balance the books uh, in this province. It'll work. It's proven. So let me ask you again, Premier. Um, you, you know, you, you made another significant error. You weren't even in negotiations with the teachers' unions, but you still gave them big pay increases. I don't know if that was payback for leadership support, but it was unaffordable. We were in negotiations, but you gave them a big pay increase of hundreds of millions of dollars. I think we need to go the opposite direction. So I'll ask you again. My, my colleague, Mr. Fidelli, from Nipissing, is going to bring forward amendments to the Wage Freeze Act to broaden it to say an across board wage freeze here, here. for all of us in the broader public sector. It'll save $2 billion. It's the right thing to do. Can I count on your support for this sensible, thoughtful question? Thank you. You see this, please? Thank you. Premier. Mr. Speaker, well, uh, you know, since I, since I've been in this office, I've been fighting for the people of Ontario to bring jobs to the province. What I'm saying is, he wants to fight with, Mr. Speaker. He wants to fight with the people who deliver services. He wants to fight with the people who are providing the education, the health care that the people of this province needs. I do not believe that that is the way forward. I would suggest to the leader of the opposition that if he is really interested in being, uh, being 
being uh, a leader in terms of uh, wage freeze, Mr. Speaker, that he would get the legislation passed that would continue to freeze MPP's salaries, Mr. Speaker. That seems like a pretty fundamental step that he should take, so we look to him to work with us on that, Mr. That's Speaker. Well, the legislation is going to pass. I've been calling for this for years. From my point of view, why don't we improve it? Why don't we actually make a big impact yeah. on the economy? I mean, I'm happy that I finally got the words wage and freeze yes. out of your mouths at the same time in concession. That's was, that was fabulous, right? But let's go a bit further. Let me ask you this, too. I think that if cabinet ministers aren't doing their job, they shouldn't be in cabinet. Right. And if they can't even meet their fiscal targets, they should dock their pay. Oh, so a, another very straightforward yeah. amendment we want to make is if your cabinet ministers cannot dock their pay, so if they cannot balance the books, they're made a deficit, just like they did in BC, let's dock their pay. Let's actually reduce cabinet pay to give them an incentive to prioritize and balance the books. Simple, thoughtful, straightforward amendment. Will you support that change to the bill? Dock cabinet's pay if they can't even balance the books in our budget. <laughs> Thank you. I, uh, Premier. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. You know, every single minister in this government has worked within their ministries to find efficiencies, Mr. Speaker. They have worked extremely hard to make sure that we exceed the targets that uh, were put in place, Mr. Speaker. That work is ongoing. We don't, I don't need to punish the ministers. They're doing the work that they know needs to be done, Mr. Speaker. We don't need a punitive regime, which is what the leader uh, of the opposition thinks he would need to put in place. Maybe that's what he needs in his caucus, Mr. Speaker. That's not what we need over here. People do their work. So, I would just... Exactly right. So, I would just say to the leader of the opposition, we are going to continue to work to make sure that we bring business to this province, that we make the investments that are necessary, Mr. Answer. Speaker. We are going to invest in post-secondary education, we are going to invest in infrastructure, and we are going to work with communities to bring those jobs to the province. That's the work that's happening, Mr. Speaker. Uh, thank you, Speaker. And let me first congratulate, on behalf of New Democrats, the Leader of the Opposition for the birth of his daughter, Maitland, and congratulate his wife, Deb. Uh, speaker, my question is to the Premier. Families across Ontario are wondering how they'll pay the bills. In the last year, our manufacturing sector has shrunk by 3 per cent. Since the recession, we're still down 300,000 manufacturing jobs, and half a million Ontarians are looking for work. How can the Premier defend a status quo to the 500,000 Ontarians who are looking for work? Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Speaker, you know, never defended the status quo. I have never defended the status quo the whole time I have been in government. The reason I'm in electoral politics, Mr. Speaker. Um. Carry on. I am in politics, Mr. Speaker, because I do not defend the status quo. I believe that there needs to be change and improvement and that we can always improve. So when I talk about our plan, Mr. Speaker, which envisions investing in the talent and skills of the people of this province, Mr. Speaker, the announcement that we made this morning, the uh, Minister of Training Colleges and Universities and I, where we're, we're putting out a request for proposals to increase the capacity of our post-secondary education system. Colleges and universities work in partnership with each other to make sure that we have the Answer. capacity where there's growth in the province. That's not the status quo, Mr. Speaker. That's progress. That's what we're fighting Thank for. You. <laughs> Speaker, the Premier seems more interested in attacking a job creator tax credit and defending her own uh, status quo plan. Mr. Training Colleges and Universities will come week, to order. Uh, will tell you that they need more to be done. The Premier knows that when Heinz was laying off workers in Leamington, they were hiring workers in a state with a job creator tax credit. Will the Premier tell families why she's defending the status quo and attacking a, pr a practical proposal that will reward job creators and create jobs for Ontario families? Well, 
Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And uh, just on, I just want to talk about the uh, the situation in Leamington and the Heinz plant just for a moment. And I want to I want to just acknowledge the uh, the Minister of uh, Children and Youth Services because of the work that she did on the ground, working with the community, and we worked with the community. And in fact, uh, Canco is going to be able to uh, retain about 50, about 50 percent of those jobs uh, at Heinz. So you know, we recognize that it's very painful when uh, a business makes a decision about uh, downsizing, Mr. Speaker, or leaving a community, but government's responsibility is to be on top of that and to make sure that there's a process whereby new jobs can come in or those jobs can be retained. So that's the work that we did, Mr. Speaker. In terms of the uh, the tax credit notion that the uh, NDP is putting forward, the, we're open to new ideas, yes, Mr. Speaker, but we want ideas that work. That is, a, that is an idea that has been demonstrated in other jurisdictions not to work. Supplementary. Well, Speaker, I think it's interesting that the um, the, the uh, Premier talks uh, like Republic Republican lines out of the playbook from the U.S. Uh, for families worried about jobs, all we see from this government is more of the same, Speaker. They keep handing blank checks to businesses who move jobs away and driving hydro rates up. Doing the same thing and expecting a different result simply does not make any sense, Speaker. It's not working for people who lost their jobs at Enerject Tube in Welland just this week or 500 people who lost their jobs at Kellogg's in London, or 350 people who lost their jobs at A.O. Smith in Fergus. Why does this Premier keep telling people, like these laid-off workers, that her plan is working? Well, Mr. Speaker, you know, the, the reality is that we have seen in the last year 100,000 new jobs created, Mr. Speaker. The fact is that we are working with businesses across the province, whether it's through the Southwestern Ontario Development Fund or the Eastern Ontario Development Fund or the Northern Ontario Heritage Fund, Mr. Speaker. We're working with businesses to help them to make the investments that they will need to be able to uh, compete globally. You know, that's, that's the kind of partnership that I think is very, very important. That's not the status quo. That means that when we work with Ford, for example, uh, they are able to build a, a platform that's going to allow them to compete globally, Mr. Speaker. So that kind of advancement is absolutely necessary. What we can't do is spend what we uh, we estimate would be two and a half yes, billion dollars on an employer tax credit that would actually just subsidize jobs that were going to be created anyway. That's what's been discussed covered in other jurisdictions, Thank so we're going to learn from that, Mr. Speaker, and we're you. not going to go down that road. New question. The leader of the Why do the Premier will spend a billion dollars for three jobs for members of her, her uh, caucus? Speaker. <laughs> speaker, my question is for the Premier. My next question is for the Premier. In 2011, Contemporary Security pled guilty to charges for violating its license during the G20. Will the Premier tell Ontarians who made the final decision to select contemporary security for the Pan Am Para Pan Am Games? Speaker. Minister of Community Safety and Correctional Services. Minister of Community Safety and Corrections. Thank you very much, Speaker, and thank the member opposite, the leader of the third party, for this important question. Minister, uh, Speaker, I think we have to remember that uh, we are. This is a very exciting opportunity for the province of Ontario. The Pan Para Pan Am Games are, is a world-class event, Speaker, that puts uh, the, the, our province, our province, on the map when it comes to welcoming world-class athletes from the Americas, uh, and welcoming their their coaches, uh, their their, uh, their families, 250,000 tourist speakers. This is an amazing opportunity to make sure that we actually also build world-class infrastructure, uh, sporting infrastructure in our province as well. Speaker, the success of these games rely on ensuring that they are safe and secure for Excellent. all Ontarians and also for all the athletes that will be participating. And that's why, Speaker, we're relying on the Ontario Provincial Thank Police uh, to, to decide on the plan of the security. Yeah. Supplementary. Speaker, seems like the minister didn't get the memo on accountability and transparency. Of uh, the government seems to be suggesting that the uh, OPP chose contemporary security, but when an experienced Ontario-based security firm offered the very same services for $14 million less, they didn't get a rejection letter from the OPP. Speaker, they got it from the Ministry of Correction and Community Services. What is the government trying to? 
high by distancing itself wow. from that decision. Wow. Uh, speaker, uh, the, 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 so our, uh, speaker, our focus is to make sure that we uh, have safe and secure uh, uh, games and sporting event uh, in Pan Para Pan Am take place in 2015. Speaker, our priority is the safety of athletes, uh, the safety of coaches, the safety of volunteers, the fa safety Order, of please. families, the safety of all Ontarian speakers. And that is why, Speaker, we are relying on the Ontario Provincial Police to make those decisions. They are the uh, they are the people who keep our streets and our neighborhoods safe. Every Every single day. That's why, Speaker, uh, the Ontario Provincial Police is responsible for the the content of the of the request for proposal that was put out. They are the one responsible for the evaluation yes, of all the bids, and they are the one responsible of se selecting uh, the successful bidder in this particular case, Speaker. Thank you. Final supplementary. What about the safety of the tax dollar? That's what I want to know. What about the safety of the tax dollar? Yesterday, the Minister of Community Safety and the Minister for the Pan Am Games said the decision to choose contemporary security had nothing to do with the Liberal government. But the losing bidder, Riley Security, got a letter from the Ministry of Corrections and Community Safety telling them their bid hadn't been accepted. Now, you can play hot potato with this one as much as you like over there, but the buck has to stop with the minister in charge. If the government is so confident minister in training the process, the university Come to order. the auditor take a look and get some answers for the people who paid the tabs. Thank you. Speaker, the, the entire, speaker, the entire process uh, uh, followed all the directives and the guidelines of Ontario government in terms of having a fair and transparent procurement process. The entire process, uh, Speaker, has been overseen by a fairness commissioner to ensure that the, the, the process is fair. But, Speaker, in the end of the day, we are going to rely on the experts on safety and security, and that is the Ontario Provincial Police. The opposition, Speaker, may be interested in playing in political games with this issue. We are interested in making sure that we have successful games in Pan Para Pan Am right today, taking place right here in Ontario, Speaker. Thank you. New question. The member from Barrie. There we go. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the minister responsible for the Pan Para Pan American Games. The minister's oversight of senior Pan Am personnel, Speaker, is farcical. This week in committee, TO 2015 sent Bob O'Doherty to pretend to be the senior vice president of sports and venues. He refused to answer basic questions about the Ivory Wynn Stadium, the velodrome, minister rowing, the shooting Come venues, and clarified that he's only relevant at you. game time. So why have we been paying him $292,000 plus $17,000 in benefits plus $64,000 in expenses since 2010? Minister, why are you paying this guy? And who is actually responsible for sport and venues now? Why wouldn't the Premier shuffle him out? Minister. Uh, thank you, thank you, thank you, Speaker. I wasn't in the committee, so, so uh, but what I can tell you is that uh, the Pan Am game, uh, 2015, the mandate is to ensure an efficient and effective delivery of the game. This includes staffing, streamlining and organizational changes as appropriate. Speaker, yeah. these staffing decisions are made by the CEO of TO 2015. And I am confident, I'm very confident, Speaker, that Mr. Ravi will make decisions for the good of the games. We will hope that the party opposite would support the game and Mr. Rafi's decision, because while he's doing everything to destroy the game, the party opposite are doing everything to tear down the game, but we are not. We are promoting the game. We're going to have the best ever pan para -pan american game in Ontario. Supplementary. That was another great answer. Another question, another no answer. Uh, Minister, it's insulting to the games that you allow O'Doherty to take taxpayers for a ride, specifically to Miami, Rio, Mexico, Phoenix, Jamaica, Cayman Islands, Barbados, Barcelona, St. Kitts, just to name a few. Minister, you're, you seem to be as oblivious as, as to your responsibilities as O'Doherty is to his. He was demoted on Thursday came to committee on Monday, playing at his old title, but wouldn't answer any questions on venues. Can someone please resend the email to O'Doherty just to let him know that he's been demoted and doesn't waste committee time anymore? Consider this, Minister, my technical briefing for you. It's Alan Vanson, the pet expense guy. 
uh, who assumed responsibility for sport and venues. Minister, do you think when O'Doherty willfully misrepresented himself at committee, he committed contempt? Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Speaker, for the question. Speaker, on this side of the House, we understand, and we understand how to manage the game. On the other side, on the other side, they don't. Let me give you some example here. The member opposite asked when was the last time. Minister. Order. Minister. Let me help him. Speaker, it was held in 2011. Allow me to give another example here. Someone treated a six-inch toy patchy in Sochi. Member opposite asked why Pan Am mascot patchy was in Sochi. Again, let me help him. Mascot patchy was not in Sochi. Ma patchy is in Ontario and, and patchy is well and alive. Speaker, through you to the member. Stop attacking the game. Thank you. Stop attacking Patty. Thank you. Thank you. Your question, the member from Hamilton East, Stony Creek. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Families in Ontario, Premier, want to see a government that will respect their hard earned dollars. So they're asking why the government picked a more expensive pan, pair, pan security bid. Speaker, does this Premier agree with the editorial in today's Toronto Star calling for a review by the auditor because she has failed to be transparent with the public? Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And I know that the, uh, the Minister of uh, Community Safety and Correctional Services has already answered uh, some of these questions, but he will want to comment on the supplementary. But um, what, I want to, what I want to assure the people of Ontario is that we believe that having the Pan Parapan Games in Toronto and in the region is a very good thing. We believe that having a safe, Secure games is of paramount importance, Mr. Speaker. We believe that having the OPP make those decisions and make the recommendations to government, of course the ministry was involved, but the ministry did not make the selection, Mr. Speaker. The OPP selected CSC, selected the company, Mr. Speaker, and this company has been involved, as I understand it, with nine other Olympic and Paralympic Games, Mr. Wow. Speaker, that this is a company that has Answer. a demonstrated track record, and Mr. Speaker, we are relying on the OPP, whose business it is, to understand security, to you, make those decisions. You, you supplementary. Speaker, uh, Families deserve full accountability, and uh, well, the New Democrats are asking who signed the contract with the U.S. firm that has violated its own license, why we didn't choose a more affordable option. It's clear that the decision was made by the government, Premier. According to OPP Inspector Mike McDonnell, the Commissioner signed off on the security contract and then went off to the Ministry for a final bid and the last bit of vetting, if you will. This lies squarely on the feet of the government. Speaker, is this Premier going to continue to stonewall the auditor too? Or will she listen to growing calls for accountability and support and a full investigation by the Auditor of Ontario? Services. Yes, community safety and, and correction. Thank you very much, Speaker. Speaker, uh, the fact of the matter is that Ontarians want a successful world-class event in Pan Para Pan Am Games in Ontario. They want safety and security of these games. The world that we live in, Speaker, safety and security is a paramount issue, as you know. So we need to ensure that we that we work with the Ontario Provincial Police. We need to ensure that the Ontario Provincial Police, which is responsible for safety of our streets and our neighbourhoods every single day, are the one responsible for the safety of athletes, of coaches, of families, of volunteers, of all Ontarian speakers when it comes to this game. The company that is chosen have vast experience in, 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 in providing safety and security for multi-sporting uh, events like this particular one, including uh, just the Winter Olympic Sochi 2014, Vancouver 2010, London 2012, and Answer. Rio de Janeiro in 2016. And speaker, speaker, this is not a subject.
for political games. This is an issue of safety and security of games and of all of our territory. Thank, Thank you very much, people. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister for Community Safety and Correctional uh, Services. I know that developmental services are, of course, much needed. As a physician, I see firsthand the necessity, impact, and benefit of such services. Speaker, as you'll know, the delivery of these services has changed dramatically over the last few years. Our government has moved towards inclusion, in which people with a developmental disability now live as independently as possible out there in the community where they want to be. Speaker, my question is this. Now that institutional care is a thing of the past, a relic from days gone by, can the minister explain the decision tree? How are the supports for individuals with developmental disabilities determined? Thank you. Minister of Community and Social Services. Well, Mr. Speaker, I'm uh, pleased to answer the member's uh, question. I want to say at the outset that I'm truly humbled to have the opportunity to be serving this uh, particular sector during this dramatic time of transition. You know, families have told us that every adult with a developmental disability should be assessed in the same way. We believe that. We've also heard that people should only have to go to one place to apply for supports. That's why our government created the Developmental Services Ontario in legislation, so that that, in fact, could happen. Before the DSOs, people with similar needs often received different levels of services and support. Today, Mr. Speaker, there's more consistency and increased fairness for people applying for services. However, transformation is a long-term plan, and we're going to continue to work with everybody in this House as we make development, developmental services sector fairer, more flexible, and sustainable. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Minister, not merely for your answer today, but also for your ongoing heartfelt advocacy. I appreciate that your description of the transformation of developmental services is an important first step. However, many families across my riding and across the province need, demand, expect, and anticipate that more action will be taken. As you know, Minister, it has been said that the mark of a just society is how it takes care of its most vulnerable. Ontarians need to know that their government gets that. Speaker, my question is this. What is the ministry doing to strengthen developmental services for Ontarians? Thank you, Minister. Well, Mr. Speaker, to paraphrase, paraphrase the Premier, I'm not here to defend the status quo. We're, we're here to uh, advance, advance changes. We're taking immediate action to improve services, address housing needs, and promote innovation in supports for adults with a developmental disability. We created an interministerial housing task force that will recommend innovative housing solutions. Good first step. We're also investing $3 million in projects across the province that will increase community inclusion and help agencies pursue innovative partnerships. We're investing over $1.7 billion in the developmental services sector, Mr. Speaker, and we recognize that the demand is growing and we need to do more. That's why I was so happy to support the idea Answer. of the Developmental Services uh, Select Committee and why I'm looking uh, so very much forward to their final report with recommendations. Thank, Thank you. you. Your question, the, Mel the member from Melbourne, Middlesex, London. Thank you, Speaker. Speaker, my question is to the Minister of Transportation. He's just set the side there so he can hear. Uh, Minister, uh, what has become typical Liberal fashion? You're trying to lay blame on everybody but yourself when it comes to winter maintenance contracts. Like everything else, there's a right way to do things and a bad way to do things. Your NDP partners probably don't agree, but outsourcing can be a good thing. In fact, from 1996 to 2010, Ontario had a good outsourcing model for winter road maintenance, and it worked. It saved taxpayers lots of money and made sure we, our roads were clear and safe. Yep. Only since 2010 have there been severe issues with winter road maintenance. So what happened in 2010? The answer is your ministry changed the outsourcing model. You tinkered with a model that was working and now it's broken. Oh dear. Minister, we finally take responsibility and admit the problems that was snow clearing this year are yours Question. and yours alone. Thank you. Minister of Infrastructure and Transportation. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. It is um, 
I, I, the, the, the person, my honourable critic, should take a little tour of Northern Ontario, uh, going back to 1996, and they have a long list, uh, laundry list of things that that government did to Northern Ontario uh, that undermined its infrastructure, disinvested in its highways, closed schools and hospitals. So, uh, no, no one up in Northern North Ontario is really happy order. with his power, party in power. But, Mr. Speaker, we have contractors who are well paid. They signed contracts that had very clear performance standards in it. Most of those contractors are meeting those standards. My job as minister is to make sure that we get good value for tax dollars and we have safe roads. And my ministry is working hard to ensure that those standards are met. And I will not interfere or politicize Answer. the proper enforcement of law or, or, or interfere with public servants holding contractors Thank to you. account to, to comply with their contracts, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you, sir. Uh, Speaker, Minister, once again, you were given a model from the former PC government yep. that worked, and you broke it. I guess the solution, Minister Speaker, going forward is for a new PC order, government please. to come and fix things Sorry. in this province. Right Minister, before 2010, we had a hybrid model that awarded area maintenance contracts for more densely populated areas and managed outsourced contracts for more rural areas, particularly in the east and the north. An engineer from your ministry, Minister, wrote a report in 2005 that stated, and I'll quote, that the managed outsourcing delivery method was expected to produce the most cost-effective service in the pro province's rural areas. So the model that the former PC government set up not only provided better service, yep. it also saved more money. Yep. Yet your government completely ended all managed outsourced contracts in 2010. Uh, Re Minister, regardless of the blame game that you Question. continue to play on media and through Twitter, can you finally admit that this failure is yours and yours alone? Thank you. The minister. You know, Mr. Speaker, the, the member opposite should, should uh, discover Google and click, click, because a lot has been written since 2005 and a lot of studies and reports. We are now delivering snow removal and winter maintenance and summer maintenance contracts at a lower cost level, getting better value for dollar than they ever got when they were in government, Mr. Speaker. And, Mr. Speaker, they absolutely outsourced 100 percent of MTO, laying off 3,000 Ministry of Transportation employees. And they did it at the time, so we could never change the model again in any substantive way. Now, Mr. Speaker, this model is working very well across the vast majority of Ontario, and we are reviewing it in a couple of areas where there are problems, Mr. Speaker, where we have low populations and a lot of road and the resources are not working the way we'd like them. Thank you. Order. New question, the member from London West. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. Speaker, there is a mounting crisis in London because of a lack of mental health beds. This week, we learned about 18-year-old patient Jennifer Watts, who was forced to sleep on the hospital floor in the emergency room at Victoria Hospital. This is not an isolated case. It reflects a systemic problem. As a London Health Sciences executive said today, we cannot continue on this path and expect different results. It is time for fundamental change. Can the minister explain when this fundamental change is coming? Well, thank you. Um, I can tell you, uh, Speaker, that I was uh, very disturbed when I heard the story that the, uh, the member opposite is referring to. I know the hospital is investigating. They are understanding what happened, and we have to make sure that that does not happen again. Speaker, we are investing heavily in supports for people with mental health challenges. We are doing a lot to keep them out of hospital, out of the emergency department. Is there more we need to do? Absolutely yes, Speaker. There's more we need to do in London, and as I say, I know London Health Science Center Member from is Huron, Bruce on will come to order. solution so this does not happen again, but we also need across the province to do more to support people with mental health challenges. That's why we have made some significant improvements, including Answer. the 24-hour uh, crisis line speaker that is actually helping people get the right care. There is more to do, and I'll speak to that in the supplementary. Supplementary. Uh, thank you, Speaker. 
The minister talks about investing in mental health services and making improvements, but the reality tells us a different story. London is about to lose almost 150 psychiatric beds, and there isn't sufficient capacity in the community to meet the needs of patients. One of my constituents in London West has been living at London Health Sciences Centre for 10 months because there is nowhere else for him to live safely in the community. The lack of community services means that patients with mental health diagnoses end up in crisis and are left waiting for days in the emergency room. I ask the minister again, what is she doing to address this crisis in London and across the province? Great Thank you. Well, Mr. Speaker, I would be the last person to say that our work is done when it comes to providing care for people with mental health challenges. What I can say, Speaker, is we are making significant investments and will continue to accelerate that, Speaker, because we know that by supporting people with mental illness outside of the hospital, we can reduce their reliance on hospitals. That work is well underway, and I, I hope the member opposite has actually had a briefing, and if not, I would be more than happy to arrange it, about how the investments we're making specifically in London are making a difference. Have we done everything we need to do? No. Have we come a long way? Yes. Thank you, Speaker. Thank you. New question. The member from Glengarry Prescott Russell. Thank you very much, Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Energy. Minister, TransCanada recently submitted the project description for the proposed Energy East Pipeline project to the National Energy Board, the first formal step in the regulatory filing process. And Speaker, some Ontarians have voiced concerns about the proposal, including some of my own constituents in Glengarry Prescott Russell. Don't heckle, uh, we can hear them. Part of which uh, the pipeline goes through in, in uh, East Hawkesbury. Recent federal election has limited the scope and time allocated for National Energy Board hearings, and this can limit community and public participation in the regulatory approvals process. So, Speaker, many Ontarians are interested in knowing what role the province will play in the regulatory process and whether they will have the opportunity to provide their input and express their concerns Question. about the project. Can the minister please tell the House what role Ontario will play in hearing the process and what the government is doing thank to you. ensure the voices of Ontarians thank are you. heard? Minister of Energy. Mr. Speaker, I thank the member for this very important question. Yeah. This issue is a federal responsibility before a more restricted National Energy, energy Board process. So when it comes to large pipeline projects, it is vital that all governments take the time to hear from experts, community, municipal, Aboriginal and business leaders to ensure that all voices can be heard during the regulatory process. Yeah. That's why we have asked the Ontario Energy Board to engage with stakeholders, First Nation and Métis communities, that and the public, and complete a report that will represent the interests of all Ontarians. Yeah. The OEB is hosting community discussions along the proposed route, which began Tuesday in Kenora and will continue until April 8 with the last meeting in Cornwall. And when Ontario intervenes in the National Energy Board process hearings, the OEB's work will ensure that the voices of all Ontarians are heard Answer. and their interests reflected in our submission. Yeah, bravo. Supplementary. Thank you very much, uh, Minister, for that comprehensive answer. I know my constituents in Glengarry Prescott Russell will appreciate the opportunity to give their feedback and express their concerns on the proposed uh, project. The consultations will not only be a forum for Ontarians to provide their input, but also to learn more about the pro proposed project itself. Uh, this is important because my constituents are asking, what's in it for Ontario? What does the province stand to gain from the project? And what criteria will the government use when assessing the proposal? So, Speaker, through you, uh, will the economic benefit to Ontario be considered as part of the approvals process? And what principles will the government use uh, when evaluating the project? Thank you, Minister Venner. The supplementary is also a very important question, Mr. Speaker. The project must generate significant economic activity for Ontario and move resources across Canada in a safe and economic manner. Safe. However, it is vital that the proposal only move forward once it adheres to clear principles. The highest safety and environmental standards must be met. The duty to consult with Aboriginal communities must be met. There must be world-leading emergency response programs, including financial security for any environmental damage caused. Current consumers of natural gas must be protected with regards to price and supply, exactly. and it must demonstrate economic benefits and opportunities to the people of Ontario over the short and long term. Part of our government's work will be to identify those benefits and opportunities and to ensure Answer. that when we intervene, 
we can do so having considered all of the factors that are important to Ontarians. Thank you. New question, the member from Holden and Norfolk. Speaker, for the Minister of Energy, I met with a uh, local couple recently. They own a modest 790 square foot house. Their last month's electricity bill, $641. 234 was delivery charge. Oh. Minister, will you explain to this couple why their heating bill is so high? Is it the cost of transmission, the cost of regulation, is it generation, the cost of fuel, your Green Energy Act, is it your debt retirement charge, is it your HST? The list goes on. Global adjustment. Is it because of the cancelling? of electricity, uh, natural gas generating stations? Or is it your mismanagement and lack of a plan? First of all, Mr. Speaker, it's their retirement charge, not ours. Right. Mr. Speaker, over the last 10 years, we have been making the system reliable, the clean and affordable. We took over a system that was a deficit, Mr. Speaker, a system that was dirty. We cleaned it up, Mr. Speaker, with our new generation, more expensive than their dirty coal, Mr. Speaker. That definitely put pressure on Remember prices, from, uh, Mr. Speaker. Northumberland, Quinty West. Realizing that there was pressure on prices, Mr. Speaker, we put the 10 percent discount on the bill. Number two, we created a Ontario Storm Energy and Recovery and Tax Credit, which can give individuals order. up to $963 per year, Mr. Speaker, and a maximum of $1,097 per year for qualifying seniors. We also to have a Northern Ontario Energy Answer. Credit, Mr. Speaker. So we have taken significant steps, Mr. Speaker, to accommodate that. But he must remember that consumption has gone up by between 10 and 20 percent January oh, over January because Thank of you. this winter. And if you choose to deny Thank that you. and and, and Thank you. Supplementary. Well, it is winter. It's always something we don't know. But I can't take that answer back to this couple. But I can guarantee cheaper rates under a Hudak government than under Liberals. Our rates, our rates were 4.3 cents a kilowatt hour. You charge 12.4 at peak. Why is that? You have a surplus of power, but you subsidize unneeded wind, solar, and then you spill hydropower, you shut down nuclear, you export at a loss. Why the high prices? Is it OPG cost overruns? Is it Hydro One inefficiencies? High salaries? Cost of smart meters? Smart grids? You get the farm club hot and happy too. Minister, what do you tell this couple? They can't afford to heat their house. You see the place? You see the place? Order. The member from Englington Lawrence come to order. Minister of Energy. Mr. Speaker, what I would start telling them at the beginning, Mr. Speaker, is that that member voted against the 10 percent discount, which is called the Ontario Shame. Clean Energy Benefit. Shame on that you. member voted against the Ontario Energy and Property Tax Credit, which saves qualifying individuals up to $963 per year. That member voted against the Northern Ontario Energy Credit, Mr. Speaker. He voted against the Low Income Energy Assistance Program, Mr. Speaker. And what he has not done, Mr. Speaker, he has not told his customers that these programs exist because he's embarrassed that he voted against them. Exactly. Exactly. Okay. No question. The leader of the third party. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Premier. The Premier has repeatedly promised in this Legislature that there will be a 2014 horse racing season in Fort Erie. The racetrack has done everything asked of them, Speaker. Now, we're just days away from a looming deadline of April 1st when a quarterly rent check needs to be paid. Is it, it's time to stop the dithering, Speaker. Can the Premier ensure this Legislature today that there will be a 2014 racing season at the Fort Erie track? 
Yes, Mr. Speaker, there will be a 2014 season at, uh, at Fort Erie, Mr. Speaker. There absolutely will be. I understand that there was a meeting yesterday, and I understand that there wasn't a resolution at that point, but there will be a season at Fort Erie, Mr. Speaker. We are working with them. They, are, uh, they know that uh, we, want, we want Fort Erie to, uh, to thrive, Mr. Speaker. There will be a 2014 season. Thank you. Supplementary. Well, Speaker, this just, does, isn't just happening in Fort Erie. The future of Sudbury Downs is also in doubt because they can't get a straight answer from the Liberal government either. Fort Erie officials feel as though the government has waited until the last possible minute and are now retracting the number of race days, races, purses and commissions that could keep the Fort Erie racetrack operating. The Premier promised action to save these tracks and save the good jobs these tax tracks provide. Is she going to deliver Speaker, or is this yet another empty Liberal promise? <laughs> yes, Mr. Speaker, we are delivering, and in fact, there are uh, Woodbine, Mohawk, Flamborough, Georgian Downs, Western Fair, Clinton, Hanover, and Grand River have plans in place, Mr. Speaker. Fort Erie, there is going to be a 2014 season. That process is in place. Sudbury, Kawartha, Dresden, Hiawatha, Leamington, Ajax, Rideau, Carlton, the negotiations are happening, Mr. Speaker. Those plans are under discussion. There will be seasons. There will be plans. And we have, we have acted on our commitment, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. The new question, the member from Scarborough, Gilbert. Thank you, Speaker. Speaker, I've heard from people in my riding of Scarborough Guildwood about the issue of violence against women and girls in the Aboriginal community. Scarborough Guildwood. You have to identify the minister, please. Absolutely. This question is for the Minister of Aboriginal Affairs. Scarborough Guildwood has one of the highest off reserve native populations in Ontario. We know that across Canada, the rate of violence against Aboriginal women is almost triple that of non-Aboriginal women, and the rate of spousal homicide for Aboriginal women is eight times greater than for non-Aboriginal women. About 15 per cent of Aboriginal women report suffering from some form of intimate partner violence, two and a half times greater than among non-Aboriginal women. National data in Canada reveals that 75% of Aboriginal girls under the age of 18 experience abuse, 50% of whom are under 14, and sadly almost 25% are younger than the age of 7. Given the tragic reality of these statistics and the national scale of this epidemic, through you, Mr. Speaker, can the minister tell us what our government is doing to address this important issue? Thank you, Minister of Aboriginal Affairs. Uh, thank you for asking about this very important issue. I and this government are deeply troubled by the rate of violence against Aboriginal women. This violence must stop, and collaboration amongst all ministries and community partners is the key to, under to ending the violence. As the member rightly stated in the question, this is a national issue that requires a national strategy. I, along with my provincial and territorial counterparts from across Canada, made this clear to the federal minister at a recent meeting of, Ab of the Aboriginal Affairs Working Group in Winnipeg. And furthermore, as chair of the Council of the Federation in 2013, our Premier made this position clear. Ontario supports the call by the national Aboriginal organizations for a national inquiry. The federal government, however, recently tabled Answer. a special parliamentary committee report into the missing or murdered Aboriginal women. I am disappointed that the report did not support the call for Thank a you. national public inquiry. Thank you. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you, Minister, for the work that you are doing on behalf of the Aboriginal community in Ontario. The people of my riding of Scarborough Guildwood will be reassured to know that Ontario is showing leadership in our efforts to advance this important issue. However, despite the federal government's assertion that they have already taken concrete action, it is clear that they have failed to respond to the call from national Aboriginal organizations, provincial and territorial ministers, and the Council of Federation. National Aboriginal organizations like the Native Women's Association of Canada have expressed their continued frustration and disappointment in addressing this key issue in the Aboriginal community. Mr. Speaker, through you to the Minister, can you inform the House on what Ontario is doing to reduce violence against Aboriginal women and girls in the absence of a national strategy? Question. Thank you, Minister. 
The special committee's failure to respond to the action call for a national inquiry is a lost opportunity. It's a lost opportunity to demonstrate real commitment to putting an end to all forms of violence against Indigenous women and girls. My friend Michelle Odette, who is the president of the Native Women's Association, had this to say, quote, I was shocked, I was mad to see how they gave the report that title, Invisible Women. It's not like we're under the carpet right now. We are not invisible. Mr. Speaker, these women and girls are not invisible to me. They're not invisible to this government. I can tell you that through Ontario's Joint Working Group on Violence Against Aboriginal Women, I am working closely with all of the other relevant ministers, as well as the many Aboriginal Answer. organizations, to find ways to tackle this terrible issue. We will work to ensure a long-term strategy that includes the initiatives to prevent violence, to better Thank support you. victims, and we. Thank you. No question. The member from the Queen Party. My question is to the Premier. Moments ago, the Toronto Star and the Ottawa Citizen revealed that David Livingston, the former Chief of Staff to Dalton McGuinty, gave access to outsiders to wipe clean 24 hard drives. Ooh, what? Oh. They are pursuing a criminal breach of trust against the former Chief of Staff to the Liberal government. That carries a penalty of up to five years in prison for the $1.1 billion gas plant scandal. My question to the Premier, can you confirm to this Assembly and to the people of Ontario Order, that please. one of the 24 computers was not that of yours while the co-chair of the Liberal campaign? Order. The member from Halton, come to order. Premier. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And uh, obviously, this is a very serious allegation. Uh, my understanding is that uh, a couple of news outlets are reporting that uh, police search uh, warrant alle uh, alleges. So these, there's an allegation that uh, uh, that uh, David Livingston committed a breach of trust for illegally wiping computers. That's all I know, Mr. Speaker. And uh, we have said all along that we would cooperate with the uh, OPP investigation. We have done that. We will continue to do that. And obviously, this. This is, a, this is a serious allegation, and it is exactly why we have, uh, we have worked to uh, work with the uh, police and answer any of their requests and work in complete, uh, in complete cooperation with them, and we will continue the to do that. The member from Renfrew, come to order. Supplementary. It is clear that this government has not been completely forthcoming Told. with members of this wow. assembly over the $1.1 billion cancelled glass pan. In fact, the OPP and the Ottawa Citizen article are alleging that during the transition period after McGuinty had resigned from office, under a cloud of allegations over the cancellation of gas plants in Mississauga and Oakville, that David Livingston arranged to get special computer access so that one user— Stop. Stop, please. Stop the clock. I, uh... I'm going to warn the Minister of the Environment. This is serious. They allowed an outsider to have access to wipe hard drives in the Premier's office during the transition period between Dalton McGuinty and the new Premier. The question I asked was very serious. Was one of them yours? Can you, can you can tell this Assembly today, without a question of doubt, that you did not have any of your hard drives leaked or deleted? The member from here on Bruce come to order. The member from Durham come to order. The member from Durham is warned. The member from Durham, you know the next step, not another word. Premier. The government services. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, this is a serious matter, and I would. Member for Barry, come to order. 
Carry on. Mr. Speaker, I would warn the honourable member. We have, we have in this. The member from Renfrew, Nipissing, Pembroke, is warned. We're going to get through this without the uh, interruption. Carry on. Mr. Speaker, we have a system here where the police can investigate. The member from Cambridge come to order. The member from Oxford come to order. The member from Elgin, Middlesex, London come to order. And one more time and you'll be named. <coughs> Carry on. Mr. Speaker, the police are looking into a particular situation. I think all members of this House would agree that the best thing for members of the Legislature to do is to not speculate to not comment on a police investigation, to allow the police to do their work. Mr. Speaker, to stand here in this House somehow like a judge and jury and prosecutor, the fact of the matter, Mr. Speaker, is we have some media reports, Mr. Speaker, about a police investigation. Yes, Let us allow the police to do their work. And in terms, Mr. Speaker, of coming forward with information, I would comment on the hundreds Thank of thousands you. of pages. Of Thank you. New question. The member from Toronto Danforth. Thank you, Speaker. To the Premier. Newspaper outlets are reporting that the OPP have alleged criminal breach of trust against McGuinty Chief of Staff over email deletions in the gas plant scandal. When did the government learn of these revelations? Well, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I just got a note uh, a few minutes ago uh, saying that these allegations uh, had been made, Mr. Speaker. Uh, we have cooperated with the Ontario Provincial Police. We will continue to cooperate with the Ontario Provincial Police. There is an investigation ongoing, Mr. Speaker, and that is that is what I know at this point, Mr. Speaker. Yeah. Thank you. Supplementary. Speaker, we have asked before, and I will ask again. Should charges be laid, will the Premier support appointment of a special prosecutor in this case? Minister of Government Services. Minister of Government Services. Again, Mr. Speaker, I appreciate the theatrics, but we have a police investigation, and I think members understand, Mr. Speaker, that when the police are looking into a situation, that members of this legislature, in fact, in many instances, the member from the P and Carlton will withdraw, and I call her to order as well. Carry on. Mr. Speaker, throughout the operation of the legislature, there is a clear division between the work that we do and the work that law enforcement does. And the fact of the matter is, Mr. Speaker, we allow the police to undertake their work. We don't speculate. We don't jump to conclusions. We don't act here like judge and jury, Mr. Speaker. We allow the police to undertake their work. And I would caution all members on that side of the House that that's exactly what we should do. We should allow them to undertake their work and reach their conclusion and, and not try to interfere through questions in the legislature. Thank you. New question. The member from Mississauga Streetsville. Well, thank you, Speaker. Speaker, this question is for the Minister of the Environment. Minister, every year hundreds of thousands of vehicles that were once fresh off the showroom floor with that new car scent have deteriorated to the point that they are old, obsolete, not serviceable. They become heaps, beaters, junkers. Many of these buckets of bolts shouldn't even be on the road. However, Minister, end-of-life vehicles contain both parts that are still useful and hazardous substances that need to stay out of our environment. Although nearly 95 per cent of all end-of-life vehicles generated in Ontario are recovered in whole or in part, there is recycling and there is recycling. Minister, what is Ontario doing to ensure that end-of-life vehicles are properly and safely recycled? Thank you. Minister of the Environment. Well, thank you for an excellent question. As the member stated, the uh, end-of-life vehicles contain potentially hazardous materials, must be kept out of the environment, and valuable materials that can feed our industries. About uh, 600,000 vehicles are junked each year in Ontario, most of them processed to recover valuable used parts for high-value metal recycling. We want to ensure end-of-life vehicles are properly managed to protect the environment and human health. Uh, that is why my ministry is proposing environmental standards for end-of-life vehicles and to regulate facilities that process them through the Environmental Activity and Sector Registry. We are consulting on standards that would ensure facilities that dismantle end-of-life vehicles and to do so properly, including removing and safely managing petroleum liquids Answer. and hazardous materials such as the nerve toxin, uh, which is called mercury. 
The standards are now posted on the Environmental Bill of Rights Thank you. for public review and comment. The Minister of Finance on a point of order. Yes, Mr. Speaker, point of order. I, um, once again, I seek unanimous consent that the question on the motion of second reading of Bill 177, an act to amend the Legislative Assembly Act, be immediately put forward without further debate or amendment, and that the bill be ordered for third reading, and that the order for third reading of Bill 177 be immediately called, and that the question on the motion for third reading of the bill be put without debate or amendment. The Minister of Finance is seeking unanimous consent to that the question on the motion of second reading of Bill 177, an act to amend the Legislative Assembly Act, be immediately put without further debate or amended, and that the bill be ordered for third reading, and that the order of the third reading of Bill 177 be immediately called, and that the question on the motion of the third reading of the bill be put without debate or amendment. Do we agree? I heard a no. Member from Simcoe Gray on a point of order. Yes, uh, Mr. Speaker, um, I seek unanimous consent that the sponsorship of Bill 5, an act to freeze compensation for two years in the public sector, be transferred to the member for Nipissing. The member from Simcoe Gray is seeking unanimous consent to, uh, that the sponsorship of Bill 5 and an act of freeze compensation for two years in the public sector be transferred to the member of Nipissing. Do we agree? I heard a no. There are no further, there are no further votes. This House stands adjourned until 1 p.m. this afternoon.